Take your Bibles, if you would, to John, the book of John, chapter 17. Lord willing, we will get into some deep water this morning. Um, I pray I'm not over my head. This is uh, one of the, uh, there's so many things, and of course in all the Bible, but John chapter uh, 17 uh, that we can uh, preach on. Uh, and looking at this, I always like to, to, to go, there's a particular website where uh, uh, it has Spurgeon sermons on it, and I like to see, you know, does Spurgeon do a sermon on a particular passage or topic? And uh, it looked like he had like a dozen uh, sermons just out of John chapter 17. And he never exhausted it. We won't ever exhaust it. Pray that God gives us wisdom uh, that as we attempt to expound upon it. Uh, that I might uh, preach in truth and that we might understand the things that God would have us to know. Uh, I want to be preaching throughout this chapter, but we're just going to read at this time verses uh, 24 through 26. It says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me by with whom or, uh, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have de declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've allowed us to be here and just to be able to stand. Today, your pulpit is just a, a, a blessing that I do not deserve. We thank you for those who have come to hear the Word of God. They didn't come to hear my opinions or anything from me. They, they came to hear from you, Lord. We know today my flesh is weak. We ask that you would give us the strength that we might preach your word. We ask that you would use me and use this time and use all of us. These truths would get out, that we would gladly receive them, that we would apply them to our hearts, apply them to our lives, that we would uh, uh, go out and share the gospel with others. We thank you for the things that you have given us in your word, but specifically this morning in this great chapter. Help us to preach with the spirit of truth and not be in error. We ask today that the preaching of your word not only would bless your people and glorify you, but would be the catalyst that you would use that someone might come to know Christ as your Savior. Forgive me my sins and my inabilities and my weaknesses, and just use me at this time. We ask that you would receive all the honor and the glory and all the praise from all things that are done and all things that are said here today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In my old Bible here at John 17, I have written, I think my old pastor had said it one time. This is the Holy of Holies of John. In John chapter 17, we find what is truly the Lord's Prayer. Now, we know that there's another prayer out there that is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And I'm not going to call this the Lord's Prayer just because I don't want to add to the confusion. Um, many have called this the high priestly prayer, which is very, very accurate. 
This is Christ praying to God, making intercession, as the high priest did in the Holy of Holies, back in the Old Testament, making intercession for his people. Now, on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest went in to make intercession for the people, he was praying for the forgiveness of their sins. He was offering up a sacrifice, delivering the blood, I guess, would be more accurate. The sacrifice had already been made. And that's the only difference, uh, I believe, here. In, 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 well, there, there's, I'm going to point out another difference. Uh, but that is a difference uh, in between uh, John 17 in the Old Testament, uh, Holy of Holies, as Jesus Christ was about to make the sacrifice. The high priest had made the sacrifice. He was delivering the blood and he was making uh, 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 an atonement for the sins of the people. Now the blood of the bulls and the calves, it did not save anyone. But believing in the one that would come, the picture that this shed blood would give us and give them was where the salvation, it was all by faith even back then. But the high priest was praying, offering up an atonement for the sins of the people. When Christ is praying here, he is not praying for the atonement of our sins because our sins have already been atoned for. When Christ intercesses for us, he is not asking for God to forgive our sins. Our sins are forgiven. Amen. 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 It is finished. Our sins are forgiven. But he is still making intercession for us. He is still praying for us. Now, in this great prayer that he prays to the Father, he prays for the sanctific uh, sanctification of the saints. And that's what I'd like to title this message this morning, the sanctification of the saints. Now, when we think of sanctification, we think of uh, 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 holy living. We, we, we think of uh, living uh, uh, as far from sin as we are able to. And uh, um, that is a part of sanctification, but I think uh, there are, are, is more to sanctification than just holy living. I think it takes place well before we were ever saved because sanctification means set apart. It means set apart. Yes, we are set apart by our life. We are set apart by our abstaining from sin. And he talks so much in, in John chapter 17 about how we are not of the world. Yes, we are set apart from the world. And that's truly what sanctification is. By the way, sanctification, we get the word saints from sanctification. The Catholics believe that a saint, I, I just found this out here, uh, I believe yesterday when I was listening to someone preach and I wasn't uh, really even studying uh, for this sermon when, they got, when, the, when the man said it, but he said that a saint, one of, the, one of the definitions of a saint is someone who goes straight to heaven without having to be in purgatory. In other words, their good works were so good and their life was so good that they did not have to atone for any sins in purgatory. So thank God if you are a child of God, by the grace of God, you are, even by the Catholic definition, a saint because you're going to go straight to heaven. There is no purgatory. But he talks. He prays for our sanctification. He prays that we be set apart from the world. Now, I've got five parts to this sanctification that I'd look, like to look at in John chapter 17. Number one, our sanctification involves our election. Uh, verse two, Jesus referring to himself says, as thou hast given him, referring to, thou hast given me, he's speaking to himself as 
himself in the third uh, party. Thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Verse 9, verse 10, I pray for the, uh, them, talking about those that were given to him, and, and you'd be amazed how many times if, if you, you look through this chapter, Jesus refers to those that were given to him. So I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are mine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them by thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, referring to Judas Iscariot, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus speaks of our sanctification. We are ones that were given to him by the Father. Understand that. We, you know, uh, we talk about being God's gift. We were God's gift to the Son. God gave us to him. We were chosen by the Son. John 15, 16 says, You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. When we think about those that belong to him, those that are his, and those that will be a part of the bride of Christ, Jesus chose us to be his, his, his children, his bride. To belong to Him. We were not only chosen by the Son, and this really wasn't so much a part of, of what I was trying to get at, but just so no one uh, uh, thinks that I'm remiss in remembering this, we were also chosen by the Father. You know, I chose Pi to be my bride, but my Father chose her too. He picked her out. He said, this is the one I want for my son. Now, we chose her because of her qualities. God chose us for other reasons. God has had his own purposes for choosing us. He didn't choose the best. He didn't necessarily choose the brightest, the most noble. But he chose certain individuals. Ephesians 1, chapters 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God. And, our, uh, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. Now, holy and sanctified are, the, uh, are, are among the, right there in the same category. Holiness is being set apart once again. And without blame before him in love. So we were chosen by the Son. We were chosen by the Father. But the scripture says we were given to the Son by the Father. We were given to Christ by the Father. Say, well, that's not much of a gift. Well, you're looking at the unfinished product right now. It's going to get a lot better. We were given to Christ, but also we understand, most of us already know this, Christ was given to us by the Father as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isaiah says in verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name should be called. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
So just as we understand, and we talk about this a lot at Christmas time, Christ was given to us, we were also given to Christ. We belong to Christ by His election. We are also sanctified in salvation. Verse 2 says, For thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Christ has power over everyone, all human beings, but he gave eternal life to those that the Father gave him. Those that he chose, the ones that the Father chose, and the ones that the Father gave him. Verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We are sanctified by the truth of God. Acts 13. Verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many were ordained to eternal life, believed. Now, I know that, 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 that preachers get this wrong all the time. They say, oh, the, those that believe were ordained to eternal life. No, those that were ordained to eternal life believed. In other words, we were chosen, and the chosen believed. We were sanctified unto, set apart unto eternal life. It was foreordained by the Father, according to, to Acts 13, uh, 48, and also what we already read in Ephesians chapter 1. Not only was it foreordained by the Father, it was fulfilled by Christ. Our salvation was already decided but the finished work of Christ is where we obtained our salvation. Number one, on the cross. Christ died upon the cross, paid for our sin debt, took our sins to the cross, bore our sins, and died taking the penalty for our sins upon himself and nailed those offenses to the tree. It was not only fulfilled by Christ on the cross. We got the victory through the resurrection. When Christ overcame death, He gave us the victory over death. So our, our salvation was purchased on the cross and it would, the victory was given at the resurrection. So it's foreordained by the Father, fulfilled by Christ, and finished by the Holy Spirit is He that keeps us, He that, that, that has sealed us unto the day of redemption, Ephesians chapter 1 also tells us. And then we get into sanctification, the, what we normally think of when we talk about being sanctified, which is holy living, set apart living, living, trying to serve the Lord. Now how do we do that? Do we do that by our own power? Were we able to do that before we were saved? We do that by the power of God. Once again, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy faith. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. You know, Pilate asked, what is truth? We live in a day where they say, well, truth is relative. Have you heard people say that? Well, that's my truth. Or that's your truth. Well, that's true for me, but it's not true for you. No, truth is true. If it's true for me, it's true for you. Verse 
The truth is the Word of God. The truth is the Word of God. The only way we understand the truth, the only way we see the truth, the only way we know the truth is by the Spirit of truth. John 14, 17, John 15, 26 refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. John 14, 26, but the, the, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, from the Father will send, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit will take Christ's words, the word of God, and illuminate you to, and, and reveal those things. He will teach you all things and you will remember those things. Chapter 15, verse 26. But the, well, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Let's throw this in, and he will, shall also bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. If you are full of the Holy Spirit, if the Spirit of truth is inside you, you will bear witness of Christ. The Spirit of truth. Who are those? According to, to uh, um, our scripture, it's those that keep his word. Um, verses 6 and 7. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they are, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And they have known all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Those that are saved, those that are sanctified, keep His Word. How do we keep His Word? How do we know His Word? By studying His Word. If you are saved, you should have a desire to know His Word. The Spirit inside of you uh, 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 appeals to the, uh, to the Word of God. Or the Word of God appeals to the Spirit that is inside of you. You desire to study the Word. You desire to come to His house to, to, to be taught His Word. You desire to read His Word. We are sanctified by His Word. The only way that we can be different from the world is to stay in the Word of God. We spend too much time in our, our, our worldly books and, our, and TV. And, and even, even the news can be a hindrance when it keeps you from the Word of God. Now, if you are a saved child of God, the longer you have been in Christ Jesus, the closer you should be to, being like, to be Christ-like. It should be a constant growing thing. If you're not growing to be more Christ-like as you go along, there you, you are caught up in the world. You are not living the sanctified life. We also see that we are set apart. We are sanctified in our preservation. Jesus prayed this prayer, this prayer of intercession that God the Father would keep those that were given to Him. Have you ever noticed a lot of times when an evangelist comes in or a guest preacher will come in and he's you know, traveled and he's away from home, in his prayer when he's praying, many, many times he will pray that God will watch over his family. 
He'll say, you know, pray for my, my family. Watch over them while I'm away. Now, God, you know, uh, if God's not watching over me, even when you're there, what can you do, you know? We think, but we, we feel like there's something we can do when, when, we, when we feel apart from them. Basically, we're just trusting them into the hands of God, which we should do whether we're there or not. Christ knew that he was going to be away. He was not physically going to be with these men anymore. He was not going to be with the, with the church anymore physically. Now, he told them earlier in 14 and 15 that, that the this Holy Spirit was going to come, and actually it would be better for them because the Holy Spirit was going to dwell inside of them. Yet there's something about somebody being there physically with you. We love getting phone calls from loved ones from far away. Anymore, we have the, the uh, you know, where you can actually FaceTime them or, or whatever, you know, method you use, where you can actually see them. And it is a blessing, but it doesn't replace being there. Christ was leaving these men who he loved. He was no longer going to, you know, Christ was still a man. He was God, but he was a man. So he was leaving them and he was turning them over, praying to God that he would watch over them and knowing that God would answer his prayer. He was praying for their preservation. Verse 15 says, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from evil. Verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Christ prayed, keep them from evil. Now we think of evil as harm befalling us. We understand that, that these men were to give their lives for Christ. The greatest evil that can overcome us is not physical harm. It's departing from Christ. He's saying preserve them, keep them, watch over them, deliver them that they might be with me in glory. Here's an amazing thing we see in this chapter. The relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Saint. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not making us a, a, a part of the Godhead at all. But this, this, this wonderful chapter teaches us that the Father is in the Son, verses 21 and 23. It says that they might be one, and that's another thing he prayed for is Christian unity, that we might have unity, and if we are all following after in the same spirit, we should have unity. And he also uh, prays in verse 26 uh, that we would have his love in us, but the Father is in the Son, is the point I want to make here. It says, they all may be one as thou, Father, are in me. So the scripture says that the Father is in the Son. Verse 23 uh, 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 says that uh, thou, uh, thou are in me. The, the Father is, let me, let me just go ahead and read both the verses in, in their entirety. And I, did, I didn't want to jump ahead, but uh, let's just do it. Uh, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 23. And I, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So we see 
The Father is in the Son according to verse 21 and 23. We also see that in verse 21, the Son is in the Father. Verse 21 also tells us that believers are in both the Father and the Son. And verse 23 and 24 tells us the Son is in believers. We, we, we talk about Christ being in us. Christ is in us. We, do, we are in Christ. Christ is in the Father. The Father is that we are all related together. And we are preserved because we are in Christ. And Christ is, is in us. And finally, I want to talk about, and we've talked about it a little bit already, glorification. Part of sanctification is glorification. He set us apart by election, salvation. He sets us apart by, by, by sanctifying us and, and causing us to grow. He sets us apart by preserving us and keeps us. And finally, finally, we will be set apart because we will be glorified. Verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they might behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. John says it this way in his first epistle. Chapter 3. Verse 2. Behold now, are we the sons of God? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We will be glorified. The only way that we can see Christ in his glory is to be like him. We will be transformed to be like Christ. We will be sinless like Christ. We will be perfect like Christ. We will be without guile like Christ. Perfect in every way. Not because of anything that we've done. Because God sanctified us. Christ saved us. And the Holy Spirit keeps us. Amen. Sister Connie, would you come as you turn to number 162. If you're here today and you've...